All right. Um, for those of you who uh, didn't stay up too late and made sure you got up early for this, um, you're in for a treat, okay? I can't even tell you how excited I am <clears throat> to have this guy here to talk to us today. Um, I'm, I, I, I've turned out to be one of the old guys in ufology. Isn't that distasteful to think about? You know how you, know, you suddenly realize that, oh, my God, I'm one of them old guys in ufology? Oh. I used to be like the, cool, like the kid hanging out just, you know. Now it's like, oh, no, I'm a veteran old guy. Jesus. Well, the good thing about that is I remember when this case broke. I mean, when, I, when, the, when this case first, uh, you know, hit the news in 1973. And um, it is one of the landmark cases in all of the history of ufology. Okay, it is as significant as Betty and Barney Hill <clears throat> in cases like that. Um, what is exciting about this uh, case is this is the very, very first time that this man has talked about this case. Okay, he has remained silent for all of these years. Um, so what happened in 1973 when he was 19 years old, he was fishing um, on the Pascagoula River in Mississippi with a friend of his, Charles Hickson. And um, what happened that night, aside from the frustrating fishing, you didn't need to put that in here because if you're fishing, it's frustrating. Okay. <laughs> um, they got a little excitement that night while, I, while they were trying to fish. Um, this object um, approached within literally just a few yards of them, a few feet off of the ground, before they could get up and, and grab their tackle boxes and run the hell out of there. Um, the craft opened up, and these three humanoid creatures came out and interacted with them. Um, so he has written a book called Pascagoula, The Closest Encounter, My Story. Features for the first time the full transcript of his hypnotic regression session with the late great Bud Hopkins, one of the world's foremost researchers on the abduction phenomenon, if you all remember Bud. Um, the book is also packed full of documents, newspaper cuttings, photographs from old and new. And like I say, this is an extraordinarily rare treat, so please join me in welcoming Calvin Parker. Thank you. Good morning. And thank y'all for having me here. This is a real pleasure for me. One thing, the food is so great here and the air is so crisp. I went down yesterday and ordered some liver and onions and I got to thinking about it last night. I'm going to do it again today. <laughs> y'all just kind of had to bear with me through all this and I'm going to try to get around to all of it. Of course, he said, like he said, we wrote, got the book, we wrote it. This came out last July, and it took me 45 years to uh, decide to do this, and I didn't decide to do it. My wife and my publisher is the one that forced me into all this. And just who is Calvin Parker? Well, I was born in November the 2nd of 1954, so that would put me at 18 years old when this happened. Brought up in a real poor family. We sharecropped and uh, worked the fields for part of the, uh, you know, part of the crops and all. And I didn't know any better. It's not like it is now. You didn't go to mom and daddy and say, give me a few dollars. I need this and that. You worked and you earned it. And that made me appreciate life a lot better. I came from a real uh, Christian family. And I've kept my moral values and my uh, religion real close to me through all these years. Although when this happened, it did do away with a lot of my church going because I wasn't accepted real good in the church that I went to. So I just didn't go. I would read the Bible myself and teach myself what I could. But, uh, you know, that was always real nice. Of course... Everybody that remembers this case knew that I meant some. Uh, I was with what they said was a friend that uh, I had met, but he really wasn't my friend. He was more of a father's friend than he was my friend. But the only thing, I was reared with his children. Uh, 
we used to fish together and go everywhere. But as far as Charlie and I being friends, we weren't. And then after this case happened here, we just grew further apart for some reasons. The main reason I thought he was the one that spread this story to the media, and I didn't want this to get out to the media. But anyhow, I'm still remaining friends with his children nowadays. He has a son that's about my age. They live there in Pascagoula, and we still fish together quite often, or used to. He's even quit coming around now. Right here is the spot where this actually happened. It's changed a little bit since then. But you could uh, see where that blue tarp is, or blue camp is. Somebody was there fishing the day we took these pictures. They used to be a pier right here. And, you know, this is where we started out fishing. But anyhow, to kind of get to the story so I have time to tell it, I went to work. I called Charlie up. I was working in the oil field 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and I was engaged to get married. I had just got engaged in that October, and we was going to get married in November. So uh, I called Charlie up, and I told him, look, I know you work for the shipyard. You can hire somebody if you want to. You probably don't want to hire me, but I need a job. I need to get something normal going in my life. Because my ambition in life was to get married, have children, have grandchildren, uh, retire and fish. <laughs> and so far, <laughs> fishing is the only thing that's happened out of that. I, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it is. I, I, I did get married. I did have children. But, uh, boy, has it been a battle. On October... The 11th, I went to work my first day with Charlie. That was my first day at work and my last day. So I got hard, fired, and had a physical all in the same day. <laughs> I, while we was at work, Charlie told me it was a hot for an October day. It was 80 degrees, humid, and buddy, it was hot. He said, why don't we go fishing when we got off work, let it kind of get dark, then we'll go home and eat. Well, the eating part left. I said, okay, so uh, we agreed to go fishing. And I said, well, Charlie, I don't have my fishing equipment here. He said, well, that's okay. You could use some of mine. Well, back in the South, you don't use a man's fishing equipment. That's a non-touchable deal right there. You'd rather borrow his wife and let her cook for you than you had <laughs> uses a fishing equipment. But I did agree because I wanted to go somewhere bad like fishing. So we loaded up in the car, and we went by and got the fishing equipment. And we left. He said, now, I know a great place to fish. And come to find out it was. He said, there's an old abandoned shipyard that kind of went out of business down here. And they have a pier, and there used to be a grain elevator there. And we'd go sit under this thing, and uh, the fish just come up and meet that grain. I said, oh, okay, sounds good to me. But what I didn't know, they hadn't unladed grain there in years. So we left and we went to the old Shaw Peter shipyard to the grain elevator. Well, when we got there, I noticed there was all kind of debris and trash washed up on the bank. And I thought, well, they don't keep things looking real neat here. I said, Charlie, what's all this mess here? This is a mess. He said, well, when the water comes in, it brings all this trash out of the river from everybody's homes. Then when it goes out, it leaves it. Well, that made a little bit of sense to me. But uh, we kind of wobbled, unloaded the car. It took us 15, 20 minutes to get to where we was going to fish. And there was a pier sitting right across from us on the opposite side of the river. And at this pier, there was a big ship anchored there. And this ship was either a NOAA ship or a Coast Guard ship, but it was big. And I was sitting on that pier thinking we just got cast out. Now, how does something made out of steel sit here and float? I couldn't understand that. Me working at a shipyard, you don't really know how, how they do float. But anyhow, getting back to the story, I noticed some blue lights flashing behind us. And it's the same color lights that the patrol cars use on their uh, 
uh, patrol cars in, and they was coming out and going across the water and coming back just like it would be a police car or something. Well, about that time, I stood up and I turned around and I looked because I actually thought they was fixing to put us in jail for trespassing, and I wish it had been that. It had been a lot easier on me. So I turned around and looked, and about this time, Charlie stood up and looked, and I was thinking to myself, this idiot's going to get me arrested down here right now. My first day in Pascagoula, my first day at work, my first job. But it was way different from that. As we turned around and looked, the lights got bright, almost a blinding. Well, it was kind of blinding when the door on this craft opened up. And we noticed three, of course, you couldn't see. You had to kind of squint your eyes. But in the background, you could kind of see three something coming. And they was coming fast. But what they was doing was floating across the top of this marsh grass about two foot. So they kind of floated up to us. And I thought, man, this is some ugly policemen. Are they coming to arrest me? <laughs> and when they got up there to us, Two of them got a hold of Charlie. One of them got a hold of myself. And I knew right then we, we were in a lot of trouble. And it wasn't going to jail trouble. Uh, I felt automatically in my left arm, I felt an injection. Because I was study hunting somewhere to run. I would have jumped off into the water. There was a lot of debris there. I know it would have been my last swim. But I would have took that chance rather than going this craft. Uh, when this ejection hit me, I just kind of got numb. It's kind of like, you know what's going on. You can see, you can smell, you can look. And, but you just couldn't turn your head and look to the, uh, all you could do is just kind of roll your eyes a little bit and see what was going on. So they floated us up to the front door of this craft. And we just went right over this debris and this trash. And then they set us out here. On the front steps, they kind of paused for a minute because they was looking, I guess, to see where to take us. Now, these things that picked us up were about five foot tall. They didn't have a neck, but they moved like mechanical. They didn't look human or anything, the ones that picked us up. They moved like a machine, and that's why I thought that they was robots. Still don't know that, but that's just the way that they moved. And when we got to the door, I looked for some kind of light fixtures in here because the lights were so bright. I said, well, maybe I could see something. But the lights was coming out of the paint. So that, that was amazing. Then he just kind of proceeded and eased me on into another little room on the right. So when I got to that room on the right, he took me and he stretched me out onto a... Uh, examination table at about a 16 degree angle and he kind of backed up out of the way and that's when all of a sudden this thing came out of the ceiling I was laying on my back looking straight up it dropped down to about a foot in front of my head then it kind of went to my right side you could hear it click then it went to the right side then behind and it clicked four times then it just shot back up into the ceiling I thought now, what's going on here? But I figured, looking back now, I figured it was kind of like an MRI or something maybe that we would use. I'm not for sure about all that. But anyhow, that's what it reminded me of. It's about the size of a deck of cards. And I did notice the bottom of it was a bluish color. So when this thing shot back up into the ceiling, I heard a little noise, and I turned, rolled my eyes that way and kind of turned my head. And this uh, female... I don't know that it was, but it was a female-looking creature. And she looked more human than she did like uh, the ones you see now. You know, since this happened, I noticed there's a lot of them with big eyes, and there's grays and different kinds. A lot of them look like big grasshoppers. This thing kind of looked normal, you know, like a, like a human being, except without the hair, without the breast, or without, you know, I couldn't tell that she had any clothes on, but I'm assuming she did. So she came out, and like I say, I just sensed it was a female, because usually a male can sense a female, and a female can sense a male. 
in, in their presence, you know, and, and that's the sense that I had. She grabbed me by the cheek, and I looked, and she had normal hands where the creatures that brought me in had light mittens on her hands. So she grabbed me by the cheek and mashed, and I didn't feel anything but just her hand on there. It wasn't no cold, no hot, no warm, no sensation whatsoever. Then she grabbed my jaw, and she run them two fingers right here down my throat. And you got a little thing that hangs down back there. I'm not a doctor, so I don't have no idea what it is. But I know when you get past that, you get in a choking mode. And that's what was happening. She got down past that thing and started prizing up. And I was thinking, you know, I'm in a lot, a lot more trouble now because I can't breathe. My nose started bleeding. And then all of a sudden, she just quit. And she pulled out. And I thought I heard her say something. And then I thought, now what did you say? And telepathically, because it had to be, I didn't see her mouth move or anything, but she had to come forward telepathically and tell me, we're not going to hurt you. Well, you couldn't convince me at that, at that time. <laughs> I said, I hate to see you if you did hurt, because I was strangling, having trouble breathing. And she just kind of backed up out of the way, and she did a low mumble, like a mm -mm. And this big, ugly creature that picked me up, he came over and grabbed me by the arm, and... Uh, I felt an injection again. Well, that really relaxed me. <laughs> so I was glad to get something that would knock you out. It's kind of like you going to a doctor and they give you something for pain, and it just kind of numbs you. Well, that's the way that was. So they kind of got me relaxed again. Then he grabbed me by the arm and snatched me up like a bag of potatoes and started carrying me out the door. Well, we got to the river, the same spot where he picked me up. He set me down. My arms were stretched out to the river, and I couldn't move right then. And uh, they was leaving, and I heard, a, heard Charlie say, Calvin, Calvin, you okay? And I thought, now, where is this? Where is he hiding? But I looked, and he was on the ground back here. And I, I felt a little better then because I, I was thinking the ordeal was over. I was far from right, but, you know, it was just beginning for me and my trip. So anyhow, we stood up, Charlie and I did, and we sat there and I talked about it. He said, we got to tell somebody about this. I said, tell them about what? There ain't nothing happened to me, did it, you? He said, we got to tell somebody. They could be invading the world. Well, what can you do about it? You know, the last thing you want to do is make them mad because they're not mad right now. They said they wasn't going to hurt me, and they done choked me to death. <laughs> so let's not tell nobody, Charlie. We don't need to mention this to nobody. Charlie says, well, we got to tell somebody. He said, no, we don't. I didn't see nothing. You're going to be the fool because 1973, you didn't hear this happening. You didn't have the social media you had now. You didn't have the TV coverage you had now. So you didn't really hear of all this happening. Well, we proceeded to, uh, this is kind of what, that, that top thing was the craft that, where I sat down the day that this happened and drawed it. And I don't know where this come from. All right, that's a picture that I sat down and did a little artwork with. I was quite an artist back in. <laughs> that is one of my pictures of the big ugly one, what I call the big ugly one. Now, we didn't, I don't have a picture yet of the female or what I thought was a female, but I'm in the process of getting an artist to do one, and I'll be glad when it's done so I can release it because everybody asks me, well, what does she look like? Well, number one, I didn't know if it was a she or a he, but I just assumed it was a she. So I'll be glad to get that so I could uh, add it to all this stuff. And this is one of uh, Charlie's creatures. If you notice the legs are together, now you could see a seam in there, but you couldn't tell that, that he could walk or the legs was apart. And then the arms was real long, and then they had the like mittens on, or I called them crab-like hands. So that... 
Now, Charlie's the one that got an artist to do this face right here. And I didn't see the three little deals he's got hanging out, but apparently he did. All right, so anyhow, we got out. We sat there and talked about it a minute, agreed not to tell nobody. So we started walking back to the car, and it didn't take near as long to get back to the car as what it did to get down there. <laughs> and I noticed one thing on the car. That was a brand-new 1973 Rambler Hornet. And I noticed the windows on the side that was facing the crowd was all shattered in place. I couldn't understand that, but uh, somebody said the noise might have done it or something. But they was in place, and they didn't fall out until we opened the door. Somebody told me safe, uh, there's plastic in there for safety glass. If you have a wreck, keep them from shattering. And I guess that's what kept them from shattering. We got in the car. The glass on the passenger side fell out when he closed the door. I started trying to crank this thing. Well, the car didn't have much mileage on it at all, and I was sitting there trying to crank it, and it wouldn't crank. It took probably 15 minutes to crank it, but that had to be the best battery I ever seen in my life, or it was energized or something, because I cranked on it and cranked on it and cranked on it, and I was to the stage of wanting to get out and just run off and leave it, but I didn't. It finally cranked. It run real rough. We drove out, and there was a little store uh, on the way back home. Charlie said, pull over here. I said, no. I was thinking to myself, why? There's blue laws in the state of Mississippi back then. You couldn't buy nothing in none of these stores, especially any alcohol, beverages, or anything after 6 o'clock in the evening. So I was curious why he wanted to stop there, but there was a payphone. Now, for you that don't know what a payphone is, <laughs> you drop a dime in there and you dial your number like that. And it'll call the operator. But it's really hard if you don't know the phone number. You just don't call information right up. It costs you another dime. And we were shy of dimes that night, I promise, because we did some looking. So he called Biloxi, Mississippi for the Keesler Air Force Base. And he got a hold of them. And uh, I heard them. I just heard him. I didn't get out of the car, but I heard him talking on the phone. He said, uh, I got something to tell y'all. Y'all got to promise not to laugh. Well, apparently they told him. I didn't hear their conversation. But they told him, look, we don't handle this stuff anymore. We shut down Project Blue Book, and we just don't take these calls anymore. You better call your local sheriff department or police department for this. Well, Charlie hung the phone up and he came back to the car. Well, we had to look up under the seat to find another dime where it fell out of your pocket later on. Well, I heard him dialing the number. He said, y'all promise me you won't laugh. Well, later on, I talked to the detective that took the call that night. And he, said, he told Charlie, he said, I promise. But he said, you know what? I laughed when this happened. And I figured they would. So they said, y'all sit right there. Because they thought we was drinking. There wasn't too many drugs back in. But they thought we was drinking. And they wanted to send a car out to make sure we didn't get on the road and run over somebody. So they sent a patrol car out. And it wasn't just a minute they got there. He looked inside. The first officer come by and he looked inside the car. On my side, he said, let me see some ID. So I pulled out what little driver's license I had back then, showed them to him. He said, step out of the car. Well, let me just let Charlie sit over on the other side. He said, stand on one leg, jump up and down, bend your head back, touch your nose, and count backwards. I thought, man, I can't do this sober, much less if I'm drinking. Of course, I hadn't been. But that's the first time I've ever heard of something like this. So I got out of the car, and I jumped up and down on one leg. I'd done everything he wanted me to do. And uh, then he got through. He said, look, there's a line right here on the side of the road. Walk this line. I thought, now, you idiot. If I had 
why didn't you ask me to do this first? It's a lot easier than jumping up and down on one leg, bending your head back and touching your nose. So he said, get back in your car. Y'all follow us to the sheriff's department. Well, that told me right then, you know, they kind of thought we was sober, and we were sober. So we got in the car, and about five minutes away was the local sheriff's department. We followed them back. Well, when we got there, they took uh, Charlie into one room, took me into another room, interrogated us. Now, they treated us real badly when we was in there. First thing they did, though, was give me a breathalyzer test to see, and that come out good. And then the next thing, they separated us and interrogated us. And then they put us in one room in there. Now, little did I know they had a tape recorder hid in that room, and they wanted to listen in on our conversations that we was having. Now, before they put us in the room together, they said, now, look, I'm going to tell you, if this is a hoax, I'm going to send you to jail for a long time. I said, man, I'd rather be in jail than where I was. Go ahead. Make me happy because that's where I want to be because what we just went through, you know, is terrible. Number one, I didn't want nobody to know. Number two, I didn't appreciate them treating me guilty when I called them for a crime. And to me, this was a crime. It was an abduction. If you're sitting in your living room and something breaks in the door and pulls you out and takes you to the van and gives you an examination, and runs a finger down your throat and throw you back out, that's a, that's a crime, and it should be treated like one. Well, the law back in didn't treat it like crimes. They treated you as a criminal. So uh, anyhow, we went through all that, and we was in the process of... Uh, Talking now, we didn't know they'd slipped a tape recorder in. And here's a copy of the secret tape. Charlie says, Calvin, you okay, Hoss? Calvin, tell you I'm scared to death. Charlie, we need to get over there and let tell Blanche. Now Blanche was his wife. I'm I'm telling you, man, something that'll scare you damn near to death. You don't know Jesus Christ. You heard about something like that, but you never believe it. And actually, I don't know why I said that, because I've never heard about nothing like this. <laughs> but uh, it was just something, I guess, good at the moment to carry a conversation on. Charlie, yeah, you hear about it. I know, Calvin, I know, but Calvin, reckon it's something the United States would have been there? Charlie, no, no, it just couldn't be. I don't know. But that was the first thing that came to my mind they have shipyards all around us. And uh, in these uh, shipyards, they build different things for the military. We have angles there. And they build like drones or uh, ships, work on ships. Or they do military work, you know, for different things. So uh, I thought, well, maybe two rednecks might have got out and going to have a little bit of fun. I know I would have got out and rode in one if I could have got away with it. But come to find out later, that wasn't the case because the uh, sheriff's department all verified it. Plus, Dr. Heineck and Dr. Harder came down and investigated the same thing, so they interrogated it. But anyhow, come to find out it was something abnormal for back end to happen. Well, Dr. Heineck and Dr. Harder had came down, but going back the next day, or that same day, we got up and we made the calls to the sheriff's department, went to the sheriff's department. Then they told us to go home. Well, I remember on the way home thinking, you know, we might have some kind of disease that was transferred. And what made me think that, I had just watched one of these Apollo flights or Gemini flights where they land and they take the family out and they quarantine them for a week. And they wouldn't even let their families in to see them. And I was thinking, you know, this could be bad. We might have some kind of disease that we could give somebody else. We might have radiation we could give somebody else. Now, at this time in my life, I didn't care about my health, but I cared about exposing the people around me my family, and my friends. And I wanted to know 
that it was okay to uh, go home and be around all of them and all. Because just as soon as I could, I was going back home. So anyhow, the show, we went to work the next day. And I told my, and they called us into the office. They said, look, I don't know what happened to y'all last night. Y'all need to give a press release because the press is down our throat. We can't even conduct business in the office because the phone's ringing off the hook. So y'all need to give a press release. We're going to uh, send a lawyer out, our lawyer for the shipyard. Y'all talk to him. And he will give the press release for you. I said, okay. So they sent us a lawyer by the name of Joe Camingo. He was their lawyer. And we told him what was going on. So at this time, he went out and he gave a big press release. And after he did that, they said, y'all need to get out of here. Take a couple of weeks off or do whatever you want to do. And uh, we'll see you later. But during that time, Dr. Heineck and Dr. Harder had called them, and they're on their way down, and they wanted to see us. So I couldn't leave right then. So during the time from here to the next morning when they got down, they made arrangements to take us to the Singing River Hospital and check us for uh, bacteria, do blood work, check us for anything they thought could be contaminant or spread around, and and really checked our health out. Of course, if the Sangin River Hospital checks out your health back in, that don't mean you're still healthy. So <laughs> after they got through, they said, y'all can go. That'd be $60 a piece for an emergency room visit. I said, okay. I didn't have $60, so I didn't ever pay them. <laughs> I, so the patrolman that took us over there put us in a patrol car and uh, said, y'all got to go to Kessler to be checked for radiation. Well, he must have talked to somebody because on the way over, he wasn't worried about that. But I noticed he sat way over on his side on the way to the <laughs> Kessler when it, somebody said radiation. So he put on the sirens and the blue lights. We thought we was somebody important going to uh, Kessler Air Force Base. We got to the front gate, and he just barged through it. He never even stopped for security or anything. Took us to the back. Then I got scared. There were six men sitting out there in hazmat suits, and they had things in their hands. I thought, man, we've had it now. <laughs> they told us to step out of the car, and they kind of stood back like this and told that guy in the car to sit in there. So they run these little deals. It wasn't guider counters. I forget what they call them. But they run them all over us and checked us for radiation. After that, I heard one of them say, all clear. And I thought, well, that's good. And they come out and done their suits. And they said, they want to see you in the back. I said, who wants to see us in the back? They said, the, the guys over the base, the military, you have some local police department, mayors, and everything for these cities here. So we walked to the back, and sure enough, they had a group sitting back there to kind of interrogate us. Uh, they kind of uh, interrogated us and all. So, but it, they were really nice. I, you, know, you never would figure they was going to be that nice, but they was real good. They had the mayors, and the, they, on the coast you have all your little coastal towns right here. And I guess it was uh, police department and mayors from all these little towns. They was planning on an invasion. Matter of fact, there's one of the little towns, our Ocean Springs, passed a law that UFOs couldn't land in that town. <laughs> and that's on the law. That's on the record today where they passed it. So anyhow... They interrogated us, told us we could go. So I left, and when we got back to the shipyard, they told us Dr. Heine could be there in the morning to uh, talk to you. Well, there's Keesler Air Force Base. Well, sure enough, the next day, I went in out of respect 
I didn't, had no idea who Dr. Heineck was or Dr. Harder was, but I knew they sounded important because they had doctors in front of their name. Now, back in, I was a little 18, 19-year-old redneck. I didn't have any education whatsoever, really, just a little bit, enough that I could read some. And uh, I didn't know who these people were. I didn't never study anything like that. But Dr. Heineck was one of the head researchers for Project Blue Book, or I guess he was the head researcher. Well, he sat us down, and while he was talking to me, Dr. Harder took Charlie back to the back and done a physical for on him and uh, talked to him. And then when Dr. Heineck got through with me, he uh, sent me back, and I got a physical. And they tried to hypnotize me then, and it didn't go over real well. So he didn't, I didn't think I could ever be hypnotized, and I'd get around to that in a little bit. But uh, then we went back, and Heineck wanted to go out to the location that this happened. So I agreed to go with him because I was thinking, you know, maybe we could find some kind of physical evidence or something that happened out here. So we drove up, and Heineck asked me, why didn't they put ribbons around this place? Man, I don't know. You talk to the police department. Tell them. He said, there's got to be witnesses to this. How about the guy in the bridge? I said, well, you go talk to him. The police sheriff department did last night. So there was a, not a tow bridge, but a bridge they let up and down for the boats to go under. And they got a tender in this bridge. And when the sheriff department got there the same night this happened, his back was to the wall in a recliner, and he was sound asleep. And he had listened to the radio, and when the boats would call, he'd get up and open the bridge and let it down. Well, needless to say, he wasn't much help. So uh, Dr. Heineck did a little walk around and walked through that mess out there, and he come back. Well, his conclusion was I went down to Paspagula completely negative, but I worked with this man for quite a while. I listened to the tapes that has been taken when they didn't know they were being taped. I saw how Charlie behaved under hypnosis, and finally the lie detector test. All of these things convinced me that he was not making it up. They had an experience, period. And that's pretty much what he said, and I remember him telling the uh, Sheriff Department, if these guys is lying, they should be actors because they should be in Hollywood. They'd be the best I've ever seen. So that made me feel good. I probably had an acting career in front of me. <laughs> this is uh, about the radiation where they confirm no radiation. And this is the Keesler Air Force Base minutes right here. I've actually, in July of last year, just read the tapes myself. Of course, at the moment they had this interrogation, I had no idea what I was saying or what they were saying because all I wanted to do was get out, go home, raise my family, or get a family. I wasn't married then to raise a family. The aftermath, and boy, has it been an aftermath. Of course, this is Bud Hopkins. And Debbie, somebody that uh, when I went, yeah, when I went down to uh, see him, and there is a copy that uh, the uh, publisher of the book managed to get. I had no idea I was hypnotized under uh, Bud Hopkins, but he managed to. Uh, I, I mentioned to him that I had met Bud Hopkins, and he tried to hypnotize me. I said, but he didn't have no luck. He says, well, let me get a hold of, he's dead, but let me get a hold of the guy, Dr. Jacobs, that has his files. So apparently there was a tape, and apparently I was hypnotized. He called Dr. Jacobs up. Dr. Jacobs called me and wanted to know if it would be okay to release these files to uh, Philip. I said, of course it would because I didn't think there was going to be anything in them. <laughs> so anyhow, 
they released the, uh, he released these transcripts of these tapes to uh, Philip Mantle, the publisher, and he's out of the UK. And Philip transcribed them all, and he put them in the book, word for word, what was said. Well, still at this time, I hadn't heard it. I hadn't read it. I didn't know what was said. Because Bud had put a uh, post-hypnotic suggestion in my head that I wouldn't remember this until it was time to remember it. And I'm glad he did. And it's still, what, would I, what I would do now, I, as I remember, I'll get my wife to go read the transcripts and not tell me about it, just to see if they run along close to what I was saying. And so far, they've been dead on, you know, what I was saying. But when we first got the transcripts, I opened it up. My wife was sitting on the back porch. I was doing the book and just kind of reading through them before we added it. And I went back there. I said, you know what? I was hypnotized. I might not know what it was about right now, but I was hypnotized back then. So she come in there and breathe through it a little bit, not paying much attention, but I, I seen a serious look on her face, and she said, I don't want to read this no more. I'm through with it. I don't want to read it. But she has agreed, you know, to back up some of the stuff that my thoughts come out. Well, and what this was about, where the hypnosis come about, in 93, again, I wanted to go fishing. You would think that I'd give it up after a little while, but <laughs> I got up. She fixed me a lunch. I said, look, I will be back before dark. You know, that's not but just a few years in between 73 and 93, and I didn't fish at night hardly any. So I said, I'm going to Cat Island. I'll be over there. I'll be back home before dark. Fix me a lunch, but not a big one, because I won't be there long enough to eat much of it. So I left going out. It's about six miles to where we were to the island. I got out and uh, anchored the boat, waiting on the tide to change. And I said, well, I'll just eat my lunch. And that was probably around 11. Now, I still, at this time, I didn't have a watch. I'm just guessing by the sun. It was around noon, you know, or 11. So I got my lunch out, and I laid it down. Well, I came to the next morning at 3, 4 o'clock. When I got to my truck, it was around 4 o'clock a.m. With this, apparently, I had from, say, noon to 3 o'clock missing time. I didn't have no idea where this time went that I was missing. Never heard of this subject. Well, I went home, and I tried to explain to my wife, you know, look, I hadn't been out in the bar rooms or nothing all night. I, I came back, I had blood all over me. You know, she thought somebody beat the crap out of me or something in a bar room, but that's not the case. I said, I hadn't been out drinking or Nothing all night. Well, she knew I wouldn't lie much just to get out of trouble. So she kind of dropped it. Well, I had a friend come over the next morning. He said, what's going on with you? Why not said you laid out all night? I said, well, she don't have no business telling you about me laying out all night. I said, to be honest, I got a lot of missing time here. And I said, this is scary to me. I don't know if I passed out, if I fell out, if something happened, or what I did in between this time. But there's some missing time here. He said, you said it perfect. He said, look, I live in Tampa, Florida, and they have a, uh, a convention going on down there. Now, I didn't keep up with conventions or anything back in because I didn't want to go. He said, there is a speaker there called Bud Hopkins. And I think he would love to see you, and he can explain this missing time to you. I said, well, that sounds good. He said, well, let's take a road trip. So we went to Tampa, Florida. That's 12 hours from the house. And I said, look, I'm not going in and talking to him. Uh, I said, I don't want nobody to see me because nobody would know me back in. I said, I don't want nobody 
asking me a lot of questions. So, but will you go talk to Bud and tell him I want to see him? Well, at this time, I didn't know who Bud Hopkins was. I didn't know how well he was respected in this community. So he went in and he told Bud that I was out there. And, of course, Bud recognized my name. And when we, uh, when he talked to him, Bud was speaking. He said, I'll be through here in 45 minutes. Y'all go to my room and uh, wait just a minute at my room, and I'll be right there and speak to you. So he came down to the car. He said, look, Bud said go to his room, wait for him in there, and uh, he'd be down in just a few minutes to speak to you. I said, okay. So I took the advice of my friend, which is, was a real educated man. I mean, he was in the medical field. He's, he's helped him get medical equipment and all. So I took his advice. We went to his room, and we sat there, me and him and his wife, and I didn't want mine to go because I didn't want her upset no more. So we sat there and waited on him. Bud showed up. Well, Bud immediately walked over, shook my hand, and started talking. He said, look, I hear you have some missing times. I want to hypnotize you. I said, well, I don't think I can be hypnotized, but you're welcome to try. I said, now, look, there's two things I want to talk to you about before you do this. Just in case I get hypnotized, I don't want you to put nothing in my mind. Nothing is not there. I don't want you to make me do stupid stuff like they do in these Las Vegas floor shows, make you get up and kiss the guy next to you or something like that. I want to remember what I want to remember on my own. I said, now look, there's one more thing. My friend is here, and he's going to set in on this him and his wife, and in my car there's a ball bat. And if you get out of hand with me one bit, I'm telling him to get that ball bat, and he will because he's a redneck too, even though he's smart. <laughs> He'll beat you to death with it, and then he's going to hand me the bat. Bud said, agreed. I thought, well, okay. So I laid down <clears throat> and went through a long hypnosis session. I didn't know it. And when I woke up, I was relaxed, and I wasn't thinking about no missing. I didn't even think I asked him about it. We got up the next morning and went to breakfast. Then we went on back home, and that was the last I thought about it. I said, you know, told my buddy on the way back, I said, he's a joke. He didn't even, near about even hypnotize me. I have no clue. But July, when we started doing this book, and I got the transcripts, that was scary. Now, I thought the first experience was scary, but this one was even more. Well, Linda Moulton Howe did this interview, and when she did it, she's an investigative reporter. Most of y'all probably know her. And she jarred, she dug deep to find out some of the information she come up with. And apparently she read the book and got the hypnosis stuff out of it and was reading it. And she was asking me questions about it. Well, I didn't know. I said, you know, this lady's crazy. I don't want to talk to her. She's remembering stuff I don't remember. <laughs> but come to find out, the best thing about it was that uh, post-hypnotic suggestion that I wouldn't remember until it was time to remember. Apparently, that was time I was sitting there talking to her and it was just like watching a movie out there, things going through my mind. And I literally had to cut the interview short. And I just kind of hung up on her for the first time because I was seeing so many things that I didn't want to see. And I told my wife about what I was seeing to see if she'd go read these uh, things in there to see if I'm actually seeing this or I'm imagining all this. She went and read it verbatim out of the book to herself she didn't tell me, but she come back and told me, you know, you've seen these. They're in the book. Are you seeing in the future one? I said, well, you know, I'm probably living this experience. But come to find out while I was asleep, apparently they come back to uh, 
get this some kind of tracking device out of my nasal cavity. And they kind of zoomed me up to this uh, craft where I was. And she started running her fingers back down my throat again in the back. Well, I had made up my mind that I had enough of this stuff that I'm going to take her with me. I'm going to prove to the people that this happened. They are going to have proof when they find me because she's going to be in my hands where I jumped out of this thing. <laughs> so I grabbed her with her th hands down my throat. Well, when I did, it cut all the back of my throat up, and I remember all that being scarred up. And I started banging her head against the wall like that. Well, we both started bleeding, bleeding pretty bad. She was bleeding, I was bleeding. I had DNA evidence on my shirt. But back in, who ever heard of DNA? If I had kept it, there would have been living proof right there. So anyhow, I got her beat off of me, and I was sick of that stuff. We was headed out the door, and this old big ugly creature, he jumped out and he grabbed me, and I don't know what he put into me. Well, gosh. <laughs> I don't know what he put in there, but, uh, well, I'm still going the wrong way. This ain't nice. <laughs> but anyhow, he grabbed me and throwed me off the, uh, throw me off of her, and we went out to the ship, and the next thing I knew, I was back at the boat. Now, if somebody had told me that uh, this would happen to somebody twice in a row, I wouldn't believe it the first time, and sure don't believe it the last time. This was just really, really kind of weird here. I give up. But anyhow, <laughs> I never figured I could be abducted twice in a row. But it did happen. And I went through all this stuff twice. Uh, why, why I got chosen, or m maybe I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, I have no idea. But, you know, I was just wondering uh, how, ma how many people this happens to. Somebody said, well, why didn't you take a phone or take a picture? Well, back in the 70s, you didn't have cell phones. You didn't have cameras on them. And you dang sure didn't carry one of them old big cameras around. <laughs> Did I mess it up good? <laughs> so anyhow, that's why I didn't. They said... I had the Rolling Stones magazine call me, and uh, they said, look, I know their shipyards around, they got cameras, and that train trussle's got cameras on it. Why didn't they see something on the cameras? I said, well, idiot, this was 73. There were no cameras out there then. I said, you need to catch up on the times a little bit. I have no idea why they didn't get nothing on the cameras. But anyhow, I've gone through a lot of uh, spectrum, hunting a word to say, a lot of criticism, and I, I've just learned to overlook it. I don't let it bother me no more. I know what happened to me. It happened. Somebody want to hear about it, I can tell them or they can read the book. If they don't believe it, that's all fine with me. I could care less. But uh, I didn't get into this to... Uh, for the money or anything like that. Although it does help a little bit, <laughs> but we've had on Amazon number one bestseller in that in this field for quite a while. I think it's down to two now. I don't know. Somebody wrote had a better experience, wrote a better book than what I did. <laughs> but I remember back when Charlie came to me, he had written this book. Well, at the time he did it, it was no social media. He come, he said, I'm going to give you a percentage of the book. I said, well, that's 
mighty nice of you, you know, Ben, I was right there with you. No, I don't care, Charlie. Sign this contract, and you're going to get 3% of this. Well, he ended up owing me money when he died. I paid his electric bill a couple of times. For the main reason, there was no social media back then. And I'll, I'm not after money. Like I say, it does help. But I'm out here trying to get a point across. Now, somebody says, are they good or are they bad? I don't know. I think it's kind of like the civilization that we live in. You know, you got all different type races on this earth. And you look around, there's some good people, there's some bad people, and then there's some terrible people. So I feel like these other civilizations are like that. You probably got good people or good aliens, whatever they are. You got bad, and you got some terrible ones. Now, I've seen pictures of some terrible looking ones, but uh, what they are, I have no clue. The biggest thing I think we're being abducted right now, if somebody would just do the right thing and document it in every way that they can, tell all, uh, take pictures, write down whatever you remember. I'd give anything if I had done this back then. Just write everything down, talk to people, and see where it goes from there. Because there for a while, I didn't believe in none of this abduction. I didn't believe uh, that there was UFOs from other planets. But you know, it'd be hard to convince me different after 73. Now, whether it was from other planets or not, I don't know. Where they come from, I don't know. Maybe it's interdimensional. Do, uh, is there anybody that has any questions on something I didn't cover? Or? Okay. No, I really didn't have a picture of it. She asked when the screen went bad that this horrible-looking creature came to get me and wanted to know what happened during then or when he intervened. Well, I guess he intervened because uh, he didn't want me hurting her, her, her hurting me, I guess. Now, these creatures, the robotic-looking creatures, I'm almost sure 100% that they take commands from this lady figure, or it could be a man figure that was out there, the human-looking figure that was there. I'm sure that they had control of them just from the way they acted and moved. And uh, I'm almost sure 100% that they was robots. And I don't believe there's no way that we could. I remember right after this happened in the shipyard, they were some of the guys got together, they said, Look, we're going alien hunting tonight. We got our rifles. We got our shotguns. You want to go? I said, no. I wouldn't suggest you go either because they could zap you in a minute. A rifle and a shotgun's not going to do you no good. But we heard all kind of stories back then when this broke about alien hunting and them coming. And it seemed like it just opened up the world for this right here. And I look around now, and a lot of the people that was back in is no longer with us because they went on to their happy hunting grounds. And I almost did a couple of times, and my health is one of the reasons that I decided to co come up and share this story with everybody. I've been through a stroke, two open-heart surgeries. I d actually died on the way to the hospital and when I got there, and they brought them little things that electrocute you and brought you back, that's not too good a feeling coming back after they done pounded in your chest there. Uh, I have a steel cage around my ribs where they couldn't put me back together again. I kind of felt like Humpty Dumpty for a while. I fell. I was in the ICU 21 days, the first surgery. Uh, then I got out. And I was taking a shower. My wife come in there. 
gonna help me get out. And she turned real pale, like the fat passed out. I said, what's wrong? She said, you busted open. I could see all down in there. I said, gosh, that's terrible. So <laughs> anyhow, she said, we got to go. We got to go now. I said, well, let me at least get dressed. So I grabbed a towel and I pulled up around me. And um, we left going, going to the hospital. I barely did get my clothes on. We drove up there and I walked in, went to the emergency room. And them nuts sent me to the doctor's office. I said, listen, I can't. Y'all call him. Huh? I'm in a bind. <laughs> so anyhow, they said, go to the doctor's office. He said, come on in. He said, why are you bleeding? I said, well, here. Well, he liked to pass out him being a doctor. <laughs> he said, you come undone, didn't you? I said, no kidding. So uh, he told me, he said, Let's, I'm getting you to the emergency room. Well, the emergency room is just right over there across the road. I said, well, I'll drive over there. No, you're not going nowhere. <laughs> so they followed the trail of blood. Somebody come out, who's bleeding? They followed the blood all the way to the emergency room. Well, they got me there, and he threw me on the operating table again. And he said, what I didn't know, he said he heard a little noise in there that he was uh, going to have to take my heart back out and work on it. I said, good gracious life. Of course, I didn't know this when it was happening. You don't realize that they holding your heart right here in your hand, and there's about a 90% chance they might drop it. So <laughs> after the first surgery, it surprised them coming back. So anyhow, they, they glued me all back together and fixed me, and they had to lay under a wound back for a while because apparently when you bust your skin opens up, they can't sew it back up. So they put a wound back on you. Now you talk about cruel and miserable, but that was six months of that, then going to the hospital every three days. It, this thing, the odor would knock you down. And I'd get at the front door, and I'd set that back, vacuum pump out there, and I'd close the door with that tube in there so I wouldn't have to lay there and smell it. But I was a sick puppy for a little while. And this is part of what helped me decide to write the book. Now, when we got ready to write the book, I still didn't want to write it. Uh, my wife, we was at a wake, and I signed a register there. And when I signed the register, normally I wouldn't sign my name to anything. But when I signed my, the register at the wake, people recognized my signature. Now, this is 45 years later, and they kept coming up and asked me questions. I said, I'm not disrespecting the family. I'm leaving. If y'all want to know something, I'll be at home. Of course, I knew they didn't know where I lived because I was head out. <laughs> so on the way home, my wife said, why don't you uh, write a book and tell everybody about it? I said, well, you know, I'm not an educated person. I don't know how to spell my name, much less everybody else's. If I find a ghostwriter, I might do it. Now, I was telling her this just to get her out of my way, put it off, because I didn't want to write no book. I knew I didn't want to be involved because it would interfere in all my fishing and <laughs> what I had going on at the time. Well, she kind of let it slip by. I said, well, she'll forget about it in a day or two. Well, then I'll be darned. The next day, Philip Mantle from the U.K., He's a publisher called me on a different related subject, and he said, Calvin, i got to ask you something. He said, have you read, Ch uh, I need to ask you something about Charlie's book. I said, man, I ain't never read that book in my life. Uh, he said, I said, I can't answer no questions about it. You read it and figure out what you want to know. He said, how come you never written a book? He said, number one, the media is going to change everything you say. Number two, I don't like my words being changed. He said, well, would you consider it? If you do it, this would be your legacy. Nobody can change what you say. I said, well, I just told him I'd think about it because I figured that would be the last time I'd hear from him. But he's really persistent. He called me back in a week. 
I wouldn't answer the phone. Well, I was fishing one day, and the phone was ringing. And just to get it quiet, I didn't look to see who was calling, and I answered the phone. I'd be darned if it wasn't Philip Mantle from the U.K. Have you thought about the book? No, I'm busy catching the fish right now. I'll call you back. Well, I didn't realize that he was in the U.K. then, and I just thumbed through there and looked at my number, and I pushed the button. Well, that call cost me $25 before I got off. I should have took his. So, Ben, I had him on the line. He said, would you do this? This would be your legacy. I said, Philip, I'll do this under one condition, one condition only. I said, I'm not educated. I'm not a writer. I don't read much. I said, but if I do this book, it's not to be one word changed in it. It's not to be one word that's misspelled, respelled in it. It's not to be a period put nowhere in there. It's not a sentence that I want to be changed. He said, well, we can do that. And Buddy did it make him look bad afterwards, but uh, <laughs> he's, he stood by his word. There's one word that I seen. I went and read through the whole thing. There's one word in the back that I seen that he uh, changed. And why he did this, I don't know. And it was... Uh, from a blowny sandwich to a blondie sandwich. Now, what the hell a blondie sandwich is, I don't know. <laughs> but he did change that word. And I said, Philip, you changed the word in it. Well, maybe somebody. I said, no, that's okay. I mean, that word's not important. I said, it was at the moment because I was hungry. But it's not <laughs> important now. So we agreed to do this. He said, well, now look, Calvin, I know this is going to take you two, three, maybe four years to write. And I got to thinking, why would it take that long? This is something I lived for 45 years. I know what I want to put down in it. And now, why would it take three or four years to write a book, Philip? Well, it, it, it just will. He said, all right. I was thinking to myself, if it takes two weeks, it's it's going to be a long time for me because I'm not going to sit here and do that. So I went, told my wife, I said, I'm going to the houseboat. I'm going to get on it. Don't nobody know where I am. No phone calls because I'm not taking a phone with me. I said, once a day, bring me something to drink and something to eat out there. Well, I think she forgot a couple of days about the eating. <laughs> she went to the casino instead. But I just kept going right on. She finally showed up in about three days. She said, how's it going? I said, well, besides my ribs being stuck to my skin, it's going good. I said, I'm almost finished. In two weeks' time, I went ahead and finished my part. And during this time, Philip Mantle was putting together all the uh, press and the different information that was in the book. And he would send it to me and then I would read it and proof it, and he would send it back. Instead of me sending him something for, to read and proof, he was just waiting for me to get it. So finally one day I had the final manuscript, and I said, Philip, uh, I'm through. I'm sending it to you. Go ahead and put it in the book. So he did that, and he called up. He said, you sure you don't want me to correct any of this? I said, no. You don't correct nothing. That is the deal we have, and that's the deal I'm going to stay with. So he's been really, really good about it. He is a great publisher. He hasn't changed none of my words. Since the book's come out, it's been number one on Amazon quite a while. We've had movie offers. I've turned them down. I've read the uh, screenplays on them. And some of them screenplays, they got it way out there like that. I'm not putting nothing fiction out there. Now, to a lot of people, this is fiction, but to me, it's true. This happened, and I'm staying with my story about that. Uh, I remember as a kid coming up, my mother used to make lye soap, and if I would tell her a story or tell her a fib or get in trouble, she'd grab me around the neck like that, and I'd eat about half a bar of lye soap, <laughs> and believe me, it don't taste good. And that's the best Sunday school class you could have there because <laughs> it teaches you a good lesson. If mom's around, don't lie. 
And she would get a switch and chase you down and beat you with it. I'm not talking about spank you. I'm talking about beating. My parents divorced when I was eight years old. When I was 12 years old, I had my own pulpwood truck hauling pulpwood and uh, taking it, selling to Mason out over there. And that's the way we kind of got, got through, you know, making a living. My father worked off. He worked for the Atomic Energy Commission, and he was gone 90% of my life. The only parts I remember having a family is living in uh, Las Vegas when he worked out uh, in Area 51 or Groom Lake exploding these nuclear bombs underground, getting ready for uh, Kennedy's big deal. You know, so I, I lived with him through that, and that's the only home life I remember or family life. Until then, it was mostly just me and my brother, and I would work from the time I was 12 years old up, and I was so close to him, and then he passed away just two years ago. I lost him. I lost a son. So it hadn't been an easy life for me. Getting up and speaking is not an easy thing for me to do, although I enjoy meeting the people. And I've enjoyed this conference because I enjoyed eating the food here, too. <laughs> that liver and onions is extremely good. <laughs> but anyhow, it, this has all been good therapy for me. And uh, I would encourage anybody else that had anything to happen to them, come forward, talk to somebody about it. Uh, let them know what's going on. And... Uh, Document it. Document it hard. Because, like I say, I just about tear up sometime when I'm speaking. So I have to make some little wisecrack comments sometime to do it. Because this isn't something, and a lot of y'all know this, that a normal person would go through. My normal life would be get married, have children, have grandchildren, and fish the rest of my life. That's normal to me. And I didn't, I didn't get to enjoy no grandchildren. I enjoyed my children. The one bad thing about my daughter, she uh, married a dentist, and she's a dental hygienist. Well, all they do is take vacations, so I don't never get to see them. You call her, where are you, baby? Oh, we on a cruise somewhere. I said, when the hell do y'all ever work? <laughs> oh, Dad, we'll get around to that later on when we go to retire. I said, well, don't plan on it. So, you know, I don't really get to see her like I wanted to. My son passed away at 22 years old. He died, and it was a terrible death for him, and I don't like talking about it. And everybody asked me why I wear this cap, and... He's the biggest reason I do. He gave it to me one year. So uh, it, I consider this, you know, a gift from him, and I'm going to use it for what he gave it to me for. I'm going to wear it. So I take it fishing. I get it dirty, and I put it in the dishwasher, <laughs> and I wash it. And it's supposedly my lucky cap, but here the last flight I took to Laughlin, Nevada, I would have thrown it away if it was just for the luck because it things you talking about bad airplane connections and bad airlines, it takes forever to walk through that airport in Dallas and Las Vegas. I, I mean, anybody has to go through that. Next time I get in my car and drive down there. <laughs> and it's been a beautiful trip here to the Ozarks. We made the drive instead of flying. We chose to drive, and it went perfect. We got about 60 miles from here, and then that's when you get to these roads that do this and that and that. Well, I've been in 25-foot seas on a boat and never even think about seasick or motion sickness, but these roads made me motion sickness. I might be here forever when it gets time to leave. I might not never leave unless somebody will come get me and carry me out of here. But... uh. I've enjoyed this time here. Again, does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Yes, ma'am. Well, would you be willing to scroll through the slide because the computer went off at the time you were talking about 
1993 and just sort of okay. see what you have. I'll be glad to if I could. Thank you. Oh, wrong way. No, that is the right way. Is it? Yeah, keep going. I have no idea what's right or wrong anymore. I wish I could see good enough to read some of that. I've never read. To. Look how pretty Paspagula is there. This is where they're going to put the monument in June. And they got a documentary crew coming out to film it. Yeah, I didn't see where it, it crossed by it. I'm actually going to throw that thumb drive away when I get through and build something that'll work. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a computer man for sure. And as y'all see, the only thing this phone here is good for is to tell you what time it is or to just pick it up and dial somebody. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. The nasal implants. Yes, ma'am. I did have problems, and that's a good question. She asked about the nasal implant. Do I think it was put in at 73 years? Actually, when I was a boy, my brother and I used to share a room. And I remember the time period because John F. Kennedy just got assassinated. And when we were sharing a room, I heard him screaming one day. And I woke up and I looked. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, there's a ghost blowing in your ear. And I said, what? He said, yeah, but he was legitimately scared. So I noticed a day or two after that, I started having serious nosebleeds. And uh, I couldn't figure it out. The doctors couldn't figure it out, but they never done, you know. Back in, they didn't x-ray you. They just said, well, you know, it's the phase he's going through. But I would bleed to the point where I would just about bleed down through my nose. And I noticed this all through the years. 1973, I think actually what was happening, they was going in there to remove this, air, uh, this implant, and then it got to hurting real bad, maybe because it had been there so long. But I really do believe it was put in there during the time of Kennedy's assassination. And I think in 93... Then through, uh, through what I understand, through Bud Hopkins' hypnosis and stuff, that they come there to take it out. And then I had to get physical with them. Uh, but after that, I went up for an MRI on my head and nose because I thought I was crazy. And it didn't show up, so apparently she might have got it out before we got into a physical confrontation. Uh, I would give anything if it was still in there so I could get it medically removed. When you go through something like this, you want to prove a point. Now, it's to the stage I don't have to prove it to myself because I know that it happened. So I just wanted to kind of prove that it happened. And that's why in 93, when uh, I got ready to... Uh, When, when, uh, when they had me back on there again, I had said one time that I was going to have physical evidence because she was going with me. I don't know how high we were or where we were or what we was doing, and we might have still been falling if we jumped out. So, But I was going to take her with me. But that old big ugly one, he was a lot stronger than I was, so that, he broke that plan up. But I, 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 I was through with the nasal implants in. I think that they had one in and it was all over. Anybody got, we got time for a couple of more. Yes. Did you ever have dream experiences about the time you were on the ship? <laughs> uh, of course I did. Yes, ma'am. Uh, more like nightmares about the time I was on the ship. And they was going through from childhood. I used to dream I was on a mattress flying. Yes, ma'am. I was going to ask you, Kelly, about, I'm from South Mississippi. I'm from Popperville. 
Oh, great. A few weeks ago, I saw where the lady came forward. Yeah. And actually seen the whole entire incident. Yeah. And that's what they were talking about. Yeah. And they said that the lady came forward. Yeah, that was Miss Blair. And um, the way I got to know her, everybody criticized her for coming forward. But it wasn't her. I did an interview on Fox 10 News and uh, with Shelby Myers. And under the comments, I was reading from her daughter, Trace Blair, or Angeline, or whatever her name was, that my mother seen this in 73. So everybody kind of criti uh, criticized this lady for coming forward, but she didn't. It took work to find her. Had to look her daughter up, ask her questions, ask her about her mother. Then she still didn't want to talk to me. I said, please talk to me. You know, th I've been living with this 45 years. She said, well, I have too since the day it happened. I said, well, tell me your experience. What did you see? I got to know I wasn't crazy. And for a long time, I thought I was going to be up there with Jack Nicholas, the one who flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, she finally come forward with this. And then when she came forward, it was more that come forward. And right now I'm trying to protect her identity because that's a decent thing to do. But since then, she's done a news media. The news media found him, and she did do a release. She didn't want to do it because her husband said, told her not to, that people would think she was crazy. But uh, that made me feel better. And since then, there's been several more that has come forward in the same thing, the same direction and all. And uh, to me, this has been a blessing because they're believable people. I mean... I've even did background checks to make sure that they weren't prisoners or scam artists or something. Because you'd be surprised at the people, when they think you wrote a book or something, or get popular, they think that you uh, make a lot of money. Like I say, there's no money in writing books. Uh, but you do have people that believe that they are that want to scam you, especially family. So... <laughs> I just try to stay away from all that, and I pretty much stay away from everybody. I, 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 I've lived uh, like a recluse all my life because I didn't want to be around people because I didn't want to talk about this. And then as I come out last July and this book come out, it's really helped me to get out and be human again and to meet people. I mean, I've met people here, we've sat down and just had real good conversations. And it wasn't necessarily about abductions or anything. Met a guy this morning, we sat here and talked about fly fishing. And that was great. It's good to get out and be around good, decent people. And regardless of how somebody believes in their religion, which I want to tell you, God's first in my life, family's second. And that's the way that I'm going to hold it, and I've always been that way. So, but I love to meet people now. I love to hear their experiences. I love just to sit down and talk to them. Now, October, the old big boy's going to disappear again. I'm going to get on my houseboat. I'm going to throw my phone away. I'm throwing my computer away. And I'm going to go out, and I'm going to fish the rest of my sorry life. I mean... It's just hard to explain. Now, I did tell Philip that I'm disappearing in October. That's my publisher. And if he needs me, he's going to have to find a way. That I will come to his rescue, but he's going to have to find a way. And I'm not going to be one of these guys that go around making a living out of doing uh, conferences. I, I just can't see me doing that every year. There's better things to do in life, although it's important. Like what's going on here is important because it gets a message out to people and the fellowship in it is uh, as good as going to church and getting that fellowship there. And you don't get stabbed in the back near as bad here as what you would if you go to church. <laughs> so anyhow, I'm going to wrap this thing up because... I done got a cue, but y'all don't know how much I've enjoyed being here with y'all, visiting, getting the fellowship that I got from y'all, and I really appreciate y'all being as kind to me as what you was. I think uh, 
My wife's downstairs at that little table, and we got four or five more books left, and that's about it. But she's got some pretty jewelry I paid a lot for to get made for to give her something to do. <laughs> but anyhow, thank y'all for sitting here so patient and listening to me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much.